Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ngantra Thantharanon, and I'm going to be your host for today. But first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tong Chai Xiu Prisha, our school principal, to have a welcome address for Professor Yuan Te Li. Please welcome. Professor Yuan Tiri, Nobel Laureate for Chemistry and President of the Academia Sinica of Taipei, Mr. Uwe Mosavet, Chairman of Inter International Peace Foundation, Associate Professor Kun Ying Sumantha Prombun, President of Science Society of Thailand, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Mahidon Vitajar Sword School community, I have much pleasure to extend our warm welcome to you all to Nobel's lecture on Science, Technology, and Peace on Earth, which is made possible by the Bridge Dialogue toward a culture from peace, a culture of peace. International Peace Foundation, the Thai Society of Thailand under the patronage of His Majesty the King, and the Natural Science and Technology Development Agency of Thailand. We are very much honored to host this special lecture, which will deliver by Professor Yuan Thiri, the Nobel Laureate for Chemistry in 1986. Mahidon Vityanu Son School is a specialized science and mathematics high school of Thailand. The school was established to provide secondary education for intellectually gifted in science and mathematics students who will be potential candidates for postgraduate education and become the world class researcher in science, mathematics, and technology of the country in the future. The school also aims to nurture students to appreciate Thai culture, heritage, environmental and national protections, as well as to have the congenial attitude towards peace and another world citizen. Personally, I am confident that your lecture will be an inspiration for young students of Mahidon Vitaya Sword School and other schools in Thailand, who would become the future scientists of the countries to realize more on the importance of their role in creating certificate science and technology for not only the betterment of the human living, but enhance the world peace as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tong Chai Shu Brisha. And next, I'd like to introduce Professor Dr. Kun Ying Sumontha Prombun, President of the Science Society of Thailand, under the patronage of His Majesty the King, to deliver the address on behalf of the Science Society of Thailand. Please welcome. Professor Yuan Ti Li, Mr. Uwe Moravets, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, Director of Mahidon Vithyanusan School, my dear students and Ajans, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Science Society of Thailand, under the patronage of His Majesty the King, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Yuan Chi Li, the Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, and also Mr. Uwe Moravets, the Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, who have made this event possible. The Science Society of Thailand, as the oldest society 
the oldest science society in the country, has promoted science activities for children and youth for about 57 years. May I especially thank the International Peace Foundation for responding positively to my request for the Nobel Laureate to speak to high school students, especially to the students of the science school like Mahidon Vithyanusan School. Science without a culture of peace is dangerous. On the other hand, peace without science is quite impossible in the globalized world. So let's make them twins. And let's make great effort to culture and nurture them in our hearts. Today's lecture is a good example of such twinning. I'm glad Professor Yuan Chi Li has chosen to speak on the topic of science, technology, and peace on Earth, which is so timely and so right for the young people in this audience who will become leader, leading scientists and technologists in the near future. We would like them to remember today and to always choose to build bridges with dialogues towards a culture of peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now, please welcome Mr. Uwe Morawaitz, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, to deliver a message from religious dialogue towards a culture of peace. Please welcome. As a contribution to the Decade for Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, initiated and promoted by the United Nations General Assembly in the year 2000, Thailand has been chosen as the host country for the event series Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, initiated by the International Peace Foundation, an independent, non-political foundation based in Vienna under the common patronage of the 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Between November 2003 and April 2004, already more than 100 events took place with 10 Nobel laureates, as well as with other keynote speakers and with artists like Jesse Norman, who all came to Thailand without any fee or honorarium to promote the kingdom as a center for dialogue and international understanding. Her Royal Highness, Princess Maha Chakri Sirinton, graciously presided over several events which in total reached an audience of 30,000 participants, including different target groups, thanks to a variety of partners, ranging from major universities and schools, to the Royal Thai Army, ministries, NGOs, businesses, media, and the diplomatic corps, which hosted the events in cooperation with the International Peace Foundation. After the completion of the first series, and a six-month intermission the second and final event series of Bridges with another 150 events will be hosted in Bangkok, Chonburi, Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, Kanchanaburi, Konken, and Nakhon Ratchasima between December 2004 and April 2005. For this second and final series, 18 Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics have confirmed their partici participation as well as other keynote speakers like former UN weapons inspector in Iraq, Hans Blix, and former UN Secretary General Butros Butros Ghali. The pluralistic program of Bridges highlights the International Peace Foundation's intercultural and transdisciplinary approach towards peace. The foundation doesn't take sides, but acts as an independent mediator by creating a platform for dialogue where representatives of politics, economy, science, culture, the media, and youth can meet, share their viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways of understanding and cooperation. Santi, may add sang kuan dai nai wela an san, te pen krabuang an, titong asai wela. Munaliti, munaliti, jeng mai dai chat kichagam san, sampan su santi watanatam, kuan piang krang dio. 
ต่เชิญเชิญผู้ได้รับรางวัลโนเบลและผู้นำของโลกร่วมกันสร้างสะพานเชื่อมสันติกับผู้นำของไทยจากทุกสาขาและประชาชนทั่วไปอย่างต่อเนื่องทั้งนี้ผู้ได้รับรางวัลโนเบลและปาฐกถิมาร่วมงานนี้ได้ให้คำสัญญาแล้วว่าแม้จะสิ้นสุดครองการท่านจะกลับมาอย่างประเทศไทยเป็นประจำเพื่อที่จะรักษาและกระชับความสัมพันธ์กับสถาบันต่างๆและกับประเทศไทยให้ยั่งยืนมั่งคงต่อไปในโอกาสนี้ผมขอขอบคุณศาสตราจารย์คุณหญิงสมอนทาสมาคมวิทยาศาสตร์แห่งประเทศไทยรองเรียนมหิดลวิทยานุสรตลอดจนพันธมิตรและผู้ให้การสนับสนุนทุกรายที่ได้ให้ความร่วมมือเป็นอย่างดียิ่งเสมอมา I am especially grateful to Professor Yuan Li who came to Thailand without any fee or honorarium to promote the events and I now look forward to his important contribution to build bridges Thank you very much Wow! Thank you very much, and I I do appreciate your Thai language. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce today the very famous Nobel Prize winning scientist, Professor Yon T. Lee. But before that, I'd like to present you a little profile about him, and I know it's going to be interesting. Professor Lee is a Nobel laureate for chemistry. Professor Emeritus of the University of California at Berkeley, and President of the Academia Sinica in Taipei. In 1986, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, together with Professor Dudley R. Hirschbach and Professor John C. Polony, for their contributions concerning the dynamics of chemical elementary processes. Yong Ti Li was born in Chincha, Taiwan, and studied chemistry at the National Taiwan University, the National Chenhua University, and the University of California at Berkeley, where he received his PhD in 1965. He joined Professor Hirschbest Research Group as a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University where he carried out studies and experiments on crossed molecular beams and constructed a new molecular beams apparatus. In 1968, he accepted the position as an assistant professor and later professor in the chemistry department of the University of Chicago. In 1974, he returned to Berkeley as professor of chemistry and the principal investigator at Lawrence Berkeley, laboratory of the University of California. His work led to a new field of research, reaction dynamics, and his newly developed methods have provided a much more detailed will on how chemical reactions take place. His laboratory now contains very sophisticated molecular beams at parity, especially decided to pursue problems associated with reaction dynamics, photochemical processes, and molecular spectroscopy. You know, in fact, he was originally inspired by Madame Curie, the very famous medical chemist, to study chemistry. Madame Curie dedicated an selfless research to help make people's lives better inspired Professor Lee to dedicate his life to science and to the use of science for the benefit of mankind. And now, please let us welcome Professor Lee to tell us in his own words, his thoughts and inspiration in his presentation today, Science, Technology and Peace on Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, please join with me to welcome Professor Lee.
Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Ms. Noentra Tantranond. Uh, Dr. Tongchai Chupricha, school principal. Dr. Kunin Sumonta. Mr. Uwe Morawitz. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure and great honor to have this opportunity to spend this afternoon with you. The title of my lecture is Science, Technology, and Peace on Earth. If some of you who are interested in what I've been doing, we do have some time to discuss later on. For millions of years, the planet Earth seemed to be infinitely large, and reaching its end seemed to be an impossible task. The Earth was so immense and had such limited population that the impact of human activities on the biosphere seemed quite negligible. Since the Industrial Revolution, however, and particularly during the 20th century, the situation has changed dramatically. In this century, the world population has increased from 1.5 billion to 6 billion, and with the advancement of communication technology and the transportation equipment, in relative terms, the Earth has shrunk even though the sudden transition from unlimited space to limited space has significant consequences, human society seems to be ill-equipped to adapt to the new limited reality. On this limited earth, with so many people pursuing unlimited material comforts, perhaps the most important challenge for scientists is negotiating energy use with its impact on our living environment. It was only 30 years ago which the 1972 UN Conference on the hum Human Environment that the dual environmental impacts of technological change and the population growth began to attract serious concern as the world is becoming smaller and smaller. Challenges for each country to combat a deteriorating living environment have become global problems and must be seen as challenges faced by all humankind. Horus in the ozone layer, the global warming trend, and the reduction of sunshine by 15% in Southeast Asia during the last several decades due to rampant po pollution are uh, such examples. Examined in its entirety from an environmental perspective, we find that in many ways the world is overdeveloped. With the uncertain gener with unceasing generation of carbon dioxide by human activities and the consequent worsening of global warming trend. The common practice or common practice of categorizing countries as developed, developing, and underdeveloped has become increasingly unrealistic. From an environmental point of view, even the so-called developed and developing countries are often not sustainable and should also be categorized as overdeveloped. Unfortunately, every developing country has been attempting to closely follow the developmental model 
outlined by the so-called developed countries, particularly in their obsession with improving material comforts and increasing per capita income. When I arrived at Berkeley, California, as a graduate student in 1962, Taiwan was extremely poor. The first day on campus, I was shocked to see people after washing their hands in the restroom using paper towels to dry their hands, then throwing the towels away. Today, the so-called civilized part of Southeast Asia seem to be mimicking this same wasteful process. The developed countries pattern of growth, which require excessive and often wasteful consumption of natural resources, obviously are not the ideal models for not yet overdeveloped countries to emulate. We need to find a new sustainable model for development, paying special attention to harmonizing the relationship between humankind and nature. It is interesting to note that when India became independent, in response to a question of how the people in that country could catch up with the standard of living of the people in Britain, Gandhi rightfully explained, to achieve this standard of living, for its population, England had to colonize the entire earth. If India wants to achieve the same standard of, for its vast population, one has to imagine how many earths it will require to colonize. It is, in a sense, very ironic that the global warming trend, a problem which could become so serious that it may eventually lead to the extinction of humanity will only cease when fossil fuels, upon which modern society has grown so dependent for its ability to drive prosperity and fuel convenience, are depleted. However, the likely onset of the energy crisis due to the gap between supply and demand of petroleum will undoubtedly present a formidable challenge for humankind. Global reserves of various types of fossil fuel, fossil energy, unfortunately remain limited. Experts estimate that crude oil will be fully de depleted in 40 to 60 years, and natural gas in 80 to 100 years. However, production will probably peak much earlier. I'm sorry to say that the, the, this loading was, uh, is not the right. I, I prepared several lectures, and this, this is so-called meeting the challenges for, of the 21st century. It's different from the one I'm talking. I'm, maybe I brought the wrong one. Well, anyway, that's OK. Uh, The next lecture. There's another lecture. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, probably I'll go slowly and 
goes through the slide of one. Okay, let me start here. Global reserves of various types of fossil energy, unfortunately, fortunately, remain limited. Experts estimate that the crude oil will be fully depleted in 40 to 60 years, and natural gas in 80 to 100 years. However, production will probably peak much earlier, perhaps within the next 20 to 40 years, for both crude oil and natural gas. This means that before we are halfway through the century, it is very likely that the gap between the energy demand and supply will have greatly widened and the energy crisis will be here to stay. The arrival of the energy crisis will also signal the arrival of a food shortage as more than agriculture depend greatly on chemical fertilizers which require a fair amount of energy to synthesize. 30% of food production is directly attributed to petroleum without access to abundant and inexpensive energy we will not have enough fertilizer to maintain such high efficiency in food production. Additionally, at present, 60% of fibers are also attributed to petroleum. In the foreseeable future, energy crisis and food shortage are most likely to become major causes of conflict in the globalized world. Certainly, we cannot go on as we have been, things have to change. And we are the ones who must make it happen. We have to face the problems resulting from energy usage and its impact on our environment. If we were to achieve sustainable development for the entire world, we must mutually increase energy efficiency reduce dependence on fossil fuels, develop renewable energies, maintain biodiversity, make a more careful examination of population policies, and reduce the consequences of all human activities on our living environment and ecosystem. But perhaps the most important of all, it is time for those who live in developed countries and consume excessive amounts of natural resources to ask themselves the question, if everyone on Earth were to live like us, could the Earth carry the burden? If not, why should developing countries follow the footsteps of developed countries instead of finding a new way a sustainable, a sustainable development based on their ecosystems. The other cause of conflict that we need to pay attention to is the fact that although globalization of the world economy is driving us toward a borderless society, it will not reduce the differences among peoples in various regions overnight. Establishment of a new common global culture. Together with more effective ways of communicating among all the peoples will certainly take time. However, the differences among cultural heritages, languages, and religions that make this world so rich and colorful will not and should not be made to disappear. As the world shrinks in relative terms and the contact between peoples becomes more frequent, whether or not cultural differences 
will cause an inevitable clash, as suggested by well-known scholar Samuel Huntington, who seem to be entirely dependent on how well people around the world learn to communicate, understand, appreciate, and respect different cultural heritages to become good citizens of the global village. We, learn, we need to learn quickly and also to teach our young people to see from a global perspective and to respect, appreciate, and understand the different cultures of different peoples. Now, let us move our attention to the subject of science and society. As a scientist, I often ask myself if the advancement of science has really brought substantial benefit to mankind. So I argue that the advancement of science and technology might have brought benefit to only about one third of the people on Earth. Developed countries seem to have fared better than others. For example, when we glorify the tremendous impact of the Industrial Revolution, which started more than 200 years ago, we must not forget that those countries that failed to catch up or failed to catch the wave became colonies of Western powers and suffered immensely as a result. In a sense, the recent history of mankind has been marked by strong competition among nations that is steep heavily in science and economic development. Although substantial progress has been made in recent years in international collaboration, the high-tech based economic competition among nations which centers around information technology, biotech, and nanoscience is still playing the tune to which the entire world marches. It goes without saying that in this competition, there will be both winners and losers. Countries that lag behind in this round of competition will continue to be trapped in a cycle of poverty and misery. We should all recognize the fact that increase in the interconnected world cannot be a fully safe if a large percentage of its population still suffers from poverty, chronic disease, illiteracy, unemployment, and other barriers to survival. Scientists can play key roles in finding the solution to this problem, and this may be part of the reason why we are gathered here today. First of all, scientists should work together to make sure that science should not be used by some to dominate others or to cause damage to a living environment. In 1995, Sir Joseph Rothblatt, a Nobel laureate, urged in his acceptance speech of the Nobel Prize that the time has come to formulate guidelines for the ethical conduct of scientists, perhaps in the form of a voluntary Hippocratic oath he argues that scientists should not pursue scientific truth simply for truth's sake without considering the ethical implications of their research. He emphasized the social responsibility of scientists and believes that holding an amoral attitude towards science is actually immoral as personal responsibility should be tied to the consequences of one's action. 
Although the idea of a scientific ethic can be traced all the way back to Francis Bacon in the 17th century, prejudice found on the values and responsibility shared among scientists and engineers have become quite common in recent years. For example, the Peace Bridge Movement for Scientists launched in Japan in 1999 reads, I, undersigned below, pledge with honor and dignity. To the best of my knowledge, I will not participate in research, development, manufacture, acquisition, and utilization of nuclear weapons, as well as other weapons of mass destruction. Last year, Dr. Daniel Tsai and Dr. S.D.S. Chen, both associated with the National Taiwan University, gave a proposal for young bioscientists admitted to their college of medicine to declare. At the moment of my becoming a member of bioscience community, I do solemnly declare that I will respect the value and dignity of life and conduct myself to honor this profession. I acknowledge that I have a special responsibility for promoting the welfare of humankind and we also behave as to pursue and exercise my bioscience knowledge in an ethical and socially responsible way. Never will I use my training to do harm to others or the environment. Neither will I do anything to diminish social justice. Whatever action I take and career I choose, I will consider their moral implications. Since I realized that only ethical, respons responsible bioscientists can hope to continue to peace and security, and thus promote genuine human flourishing. I make this declaration wholeheartedly and upon my honor. It is certainly very important for the individual scientists to see to it that science brings benefit to mankind and it should not be used for evil purposes or to cause unexpected negative consequences. However, if we continue to engage in the fierce high-tech based economic competition among nations, it might not be enough for the individual scientists to simply not participate in the research, development, manufacture, acquisition, and utilization of nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, or their means of delivery. At the current stage of human development on Earth, there's a difference between the responsibility of the individual scientists and of scientists as a whole. If we do not fully appreciate and understand the rules of the game and the consequences of competition in the globalized market-driven economy, practicing the so-called good sciences for the greater good can still produce miserable losers among us when these good sciences are used as a tool for global economic competition. Just like the Industrial Revolution of the past, new global competitions based on information science and, and biotechnology are sure to produce losers. And these nations will again remain poor and miserable. We need to realize that a nation can sustain its prosperity only when surrounded by its prosperous neighbors. A commitment to mutual prosperity in lifting our neighbors along with us ourselves seems to be one of the best strategies 
in a globalized world. For centuries, the scientific knowledge accumulated by mankind has been shared quite freely among scientists. Scientists generally believe, still believe firmly that the knowledge accumulated through their efforts should be shared by all, as first advocated by Francis Bacon many years ago. Early last century, when Madame Curie was asked why she didn't apply for patents on her discoveries, after all, if she had done so, she would have been as wealthy as Thomas Edison at that time. Her reply was quite simple. She did not want to take that advantage because she believed that scientific knowledge should belong to all mankind. In fact, it was her idealistic mindset which first attracted me to science when I was young. In a modern society, however, a scientific knowledge is further developed, transformed into technology, and put to use in society, it becomes the basis for economic competition. Protection of patents and intellectual pro pro property rights has become a very important issue, and sharing of knowledge now only stops and the basic scientific knowledge, which are not very useful, and so-called pre-competitive technology. Competitive technology is not freely shared. However, the gap or time lag between scientific discovery and technology in the marketplace has become shorter and shorter. The lag was 100 years for automobiles five years for computers, and only 18 months for microprocessors. Now in certain areas of scientific investigation, it is no longer possible to distinguish between basic research and associated competitive technology. As the relation between science and technology grows ever closer, the dilemma of to share or not to share has become an important issue, not only for the application of technologies, but also for the basic scientific discoveries themselves. From a globalized viewpoint, it certainly does not seem fair. If some countries produce most of the public held scientific knowledge, while others mainly dedicate themselves to protected, mission-oriented technological development to gain a competitive economic edge. Certainly, in a market-driven economy, free and open economic competition and adequate protection of intellectual property rights are necessary for development. Yet, we must ask seriously whether, in a highly globalized world, we can find a new and better way to allow the creation and sharing of knowledge, while at the same time allowing technology to be carried out in a more orderly fashion to promote sustainable development for the entire world. strong global public support for the advancement of science, the development of technology, and shortening of the patent protection period might help push change in that direction. In recent years, in the field of high energy physics and astronomy, scientists have shared their knowledge quite freely and have been more willing to help each other across national boundaries. On the other hand, in the field of biology, scientists tend to protect the intellectual property rights more tightly. In an international meeting of biological sciences 
it is often seen that scientists try to learn as much as possible and to review as little as they can on critical issues that might increase competitiveness. Whether this is due to the fact that high energy physics and astronomy are supported by public funds while the profit making pharmaceutical industry dominate many areas of biological research is worth studying in great detail. Many of the problems we face today are problems that cannot be solved with current scientific knowledge and technologies. They await the accumulation of new knowledge and the development of new technologies. That is why it is so important to continue our efforts to advance science and technology and develop a new generation of creative scientists. The 21st century will be a critical turning point for mankind. I'm quite certain that the globalization of the world economy will ultimately reduce the risk of military confrontations being used to settle international dispute. If what replaces military confrontation, however, is simply high-tech based economic competition, then the tensions between advancement of science and the sharing of technology, between economic rationality and the political patience of nation state will not be resolved. And the advancement of science and technology will continue to be used as tool of domination by some rather than for the liberation of all. If, however, we learn to solve problems together, learn to share knowledge, new technological options, and the limited resources available, learn to respect and understand different cultural heritages, then it will be possible to realize the establishment of genuine global village that promotes sustainable development for all. This is the first time in human history that all human beings on earth have been faced with learning to work together and live together as one family in a global village. This is a time for finally realizing the planet Earth is finite in space capacity and natural resources. This is a necessary awakening vital for the survival and sustainable development of mankind. I believe that if we make the correct choice at this crossroads, then the 21st century is likely to be marked as the great turning point, the great transition toward the dawning of a new era in the history of mankind. To meet the challenges of the 21st century, I think I'm going to continue a little bit with the, that were not in your text. But I do want to mention a little bit about education. To meet the challenges of the 21st century, proper education of a younger generation is of utmost importance. Indeed, many countries around the world are now engaged in educational reform. Educational systems in many countries, it seems, have not caught up with the changing world. It is quite clear that young people need to do better in mathematics, reading, communication, and science in order to, competitive, in order to be competitive in the globalized world just like you're doing in this school. But it is also seem clear that education should, in the future, 
go far beyond the goal of achieving competitiveness. It is important for us to educate all people on Earth to be good citizens of the global village. To ensure a combination of life skills and global viewpoint, the personal tools for a productive living in this changing world. As the human society continues to develop, we need to continuously change the way we bring up our new generation or the new generation of scholars. At present, many countries around the world are engaged in the educational reform. However, in many Asian countries, partly because of the keen competition among students seeking admission to higher education, and partly because of the excessive reliance of one-time written entrance examination for the admission, K-12 education is often distorted from the real educational goal. Students seem to spend most of their time getting trained rather than educated. In training, students often carry out repetitious work and learn to solve problems which have been solved before and have clear solutions. On the other hand, we educate our young to become a mature, well-rounded person who can solve many difficult problems which have never been solved before or problems of the future. In order to do well in the insurance examination of a university, students need to be trained to become skillful technicians who can solve problems in the examination paper efficiently. Unfortunately, the ability to do well in written examination has very little to do with the ability of scientific discovery in the future. To be a good scientist or a good scholar, some basic training of course needed, but it is more important to be well educated. I would like to call your attention to the fact that the nature of the economies is fundamentally changed in the information age. As intelligent machines take over a growing array of routine business functions, the work left for humans is increasing the, the non-programmable task. Those in which surprise and variability must be accommodated where only adaptive human intelligence can make the evaluations and decisions needed. In a sense, the common practice in the past for a student to learn some skills in a specific field in the university to, skill, to secure a job to which one could apply one's skills for the entire lifetime is no longer the scenario one should expect. Job market will continue to change due to economic and technological factors. And it is necessary for students in the 21st century to have more and better education. Although I visited very briefly to your school, well, I was very pleased to see that the education in your school seemed to be much better. More stress was placed on the research rather than rote learning of acquired knowledge. And this is certainly very important. Pretty soon, you're going to find you are going to push to the limit of our knowledge and you are going to the unknown world to acquire new knowledge and develop new technologies. So this 
is very different from the past when you are in the junior high school or in high school. You seem to learn very hard on the knowledge we have at the present time. That is really very little. And on the world, it's much bigger. The knowledge accumulated by mankind is by no means perfect. We still have a long way to go. And I hope the young generation, especially the young student in this room, will be able to discover new scientific knowledge and develop new technologies. Well, thank you very much. ที่ท่านโปรเฟสเซอร์ลีได้พูดเสริมเข้ามานะครับนอกเหนือจากเอกสารที่แจกไปแล้วซึ่งมีการแปลอย่างละเอียดอยู่แล้วนะครับท่าน
ถ้ายังไม่มีนะครับ uh, Professor I think maybe I'd like to ask the first question sure. you we're know, waiting for some um, you were talking about the uh, well information technology age um, yeah. that's actually having a lot of consequence to our living um, now everything is happening so fast uh, with the mobile phones internet email and so on um, what is your recommendation for the student like these to use these kind of or adapt to the change of technology wisely so that they not get misled you know like phone all the time and mm -hmm. and emails which they have to answer every day and so on like that yeah. uh, as I was saying that the in the information age you can get lots of information from many different places but that information is not going to be very useful unless you learn to transform into knowledge so the transformation of information to knowledge and then you have to transform further to become your wisdom so I did see many students spend so much time and try to see what's going on around the world and accumulate so much information then you don't have time to transform those information to knowledge and then to wisdom so although you have lots of information but you are not a wise person so it is important that one has to spend some time to think yourself and learn the transformation process so you can become a wise person โดยสรุปนะครับอาจารย์รัตชาติก็ถามให้พวกเราก่อนนะครับว่าปัจจุบันที่เป็นยุคของการสื่อสารและข้อมูลนะครับมีข้อมูลต่างๆที่เราจะที่ไหลเข้ามาสู่ชีวิตเราเนี่ยมากมายไม่ว่าจะเป็นโทรศัพท์มือถืออินเทอร์เน็ตอะไรต่างๆนะครับอาจารย์รัตชาติก็ถามว่าโปรเฟสเซอร์ลีมีแนะนํายังไงนะครับเกี่ยวกับการที่เกี่ยวกับข้อมูลพวกนี้นะครับว่าเรามีการจัดการกับมันยังไงนะครับโปรเฟสเซอร์ลีก็บอกว่าในการจัดการข้อมูลนั้นเนี่ยสิ่งที่สำคัญที่สุดก็คือต้องสามารถที่จะนำเอาข้อมูลเหล่านั้นเนี่ยมาทำให้เกิดเป็นองค์ความรู้นะครับเกิดเป็นความรู้ขึ้นมาให้ได้ในตัวเรานะครับคือต้องมีเวลาที่จะนั่งคิดและวิเคราะห์ข้อมูลย่อยข้อมูลนั้นให้เกิดเป็นความรู้ขึ้นมาแล้วนำเอาความรู้นั้นมาใช้ให้ได้นะครับแล้วทำให้เกิดทำให้ตัวเราเป็นคนที่เรียกเป็นเป็น wisdom นะผมยังนึกภาษาไทยไม่ออกนะครับว่า wisdom นี่คืออะไรคือทาให้เราคงจะเป็นเป็นความผู้รู้ผู้ฉลาดขึ้นแล้วนะทำให้เกิดความฉลาดขึ้นในตัวเรานะครับเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยก็คือว่าข้อมูลไม่ใช่สิ่งที่สําคัญนะครับแต่สิ่งที่สําคัญก็คือเราต้องมีเวลาที่จะมานั่งคิดวิเคราะห์ข้อมูลเหล่านั้นแล้วเปลี่ยนเป็นองค์ความรู้นะครับสรุปย่อๆเป็นอย่างนั้นนะครับทีนี้ไม่ทราบผู้เรามีความมีคําถามเนี่ยครับอะไรก็ได้นะครับที่อยากจะถามนะครับผมเชื่อว่าเวสเซอร์ลียินดีจะตอบนี้ถึงจะมีมาหนึ่งเชื่อเลยครับมีคำถามมาจากไม่มีชื่อนะครับแต่คิดว่าคำถามก็คือว่าอยากจะเรียนทำเพื่อเสรีว่าโรงเรียนกวดวิชาหรือการกวดวิชาเนี่ยนะครับนะครับมันมีความสำคัญแค่ไหนในการเรียนนะครับ okay. This is a question from a student and I think it's related to your your talk is that um, the tutorial that they are having especially the tutorial in chemistry is it important in the school career I mean should they have tutorials extra to their yes. normal teaching yeah well there's always a question of how much you learn as I was saying that the lots of tutorial try to make you familiarize with the content of what you are learning rather than be more inventive and I do feel that students should have lots of time own time tutorial takes up their own time and it's not fair and in high school you should allow students to explore themselves and learning themselves so i have the opinion that they uh, we should not teach them so much we teach them some important things but not so much information you have to teach them how to acquire acquire knowledge and that's important I was rather fortunate when I was in high school school it was over before three o'clock and then I 
lots of free times to explore, to study, and read many interesting things, and talk to lots of people. And now in Taiwan, the student will go to the class tutorial will be nine o'clock at night, and I saw they are ruining all the students by that way. ครับก็เป็นคำตอบที่ professor Li ได้พูดตั้งแต่ต้นนะครับก็คือว่าท่านอยากให้นักเรียนเนี่ยใช้เวลาให้เป็นประโยชน์นะครับการที่มีทิวทอเรียลนี้ก็เหมือนกับการที่เราเอาข้อมูลโหลดเข้ากับตัวเองมากขึ้นนะครับจริงๆแล้วเวลาที่เราไปทิวทอเรียลเนี่ยเราควรจะใช้ในการค้นคว้าหาความรู้เองจะดีกว่านะครับหรือว่าทํางานวิจัยหรืออะไรก็ได้นะครับอาจจะทําให้ความรู้เราเนี่ยกว้างขวางมากขึ้นนะครับก็ท่านใช้คําว่าใช้เวลานั้น acquire knowledge นะฮะคือหาความรู้แล้วเราจะเป็นคนฉลาดขึ้นนะครับมีคำถาม There's a lot of questions actually up here that it's quite interesting. Um, let me start with this one. Um, I said this is a question. I said, what kind of science that you think will be uh, important in the future, other than biotechnology? นะครับมีคำถามที่ถามว่ามีวิทยาศาสตร์แขนงใดนะครับที่คิดที่คิดว่าจะน่าสำคัญนะครับนอกจากทางสาขาวิชาเทคโนโลยีชีวภาพครับ Well, for thousands of thousands of years, mankind were interested in the origin of the universe, or the origin of life, structure of matters, and forces operating in the universe. And those are the fundamental questions people ask all the time. But during the 20th century, because of various experimental apparatus, One has been able to, to observe those microscopic particle electron nuclei. So we learn the fundamental law of physics of small particles like quantum mechanics, and that influenced the science of the 20th century. Accelerators, all on the elementary particle, and connecting the microscopic world to the macroscopic world. But in the 21st century, we do have the tool, like sequencing DNA and determine the structure of large biological molecule. So, in this century, it's it's really uh, I don't really want to say it's the biotechnology. It's a biology, understanding the disease or many other phenomena related to the life sciences. Certainly. Will be fast-moving area for this century. The only reason is we are developing so many new tools. Um, Dr. Kurt v u t r i is talking about NMR. Now we have 920 megahertz high field NMR can determine the structure of big biological molecule in solution, and those advances will allow us to understand biology in a big way. But I do want to say one thing, though. When I was a student in Taiwan University in 1955, I was told, "If I want to be a good chemist, you have to learn physics." For this century, I would say the same thing. You want to be a good biologist, you better learn good chemistry and physics. Otherwise, w o u l d not have a big breakthrough. ครับโปรเฟสเซอร์ลีก็ได้ตอบคําถามนี้นะครับก็คือว่าจริงๆแล้วก็เป็นคําถามที่หลายๆท่านคงคงอยากทราบนะว่าทําไมถึงเป็นปีหรือว่าเป็นศตวรรษของไบโอเทคโนโลยีนะครับจริงๆแล้วท่านก็ได้ตอบมาว่ามันคือการช่วงจังหวะของการเติบโตนะครับเพราะว่าเรื่องของฟิสิกส์เรื่องของกายภาพเนี่ยได้มีการเติบโตมาแล้วในศตวรรษก่อนๆน,นะครับเพราะฉะนั้นก็คืออันนี้เป็นการเติบโตที่เกิดขึ้นใหม่เนื่องจากว่าเราได้มีอุปกรณ์เครื่องมือนะครับองค์ประกอบต่างๆที่เริ่มพร้อมแล้วนะฮะที่จะเข้ามาในสู่ศตวรรษนี้นะครับก็เลยเป็นศตวรรษของไบโอเทคโนโลยีนะครับหรือว่าเป็นของชีวภาพต่างๆแต่ว่าท่านก็ได้สรุปตอนท้ายนิดนึงว่าแม้ว่าจะเป็นไบโอเทคโนโลยีก็จริงนะครับไม่ได้หมายความว่านักเรียนจะกระโดดเข้าไปเรียนชีววิทยาหรือว่าไบโอเคมีสตรีนะฮะ
ชีวเคมีทันทีนะครับเพราะว่าทุกอย่างก็ต้องมีขั้นมีตอนนะฮะก็คือว่าในศตวรรษก่อนๆทุกคนก็จะเรียนฟิสิกส์นะครับแล้วก็จากฟิสิกส์ก็จะเลื่อนมาเรียนเคมีนะครับซึ่งท่านก็ได้เรียนเคมีมาแต่ว่าท่านก็ยังแนะนําให้เด็กนักเรียนเนี่ยต้องเรียนเคมีเรียนฟิสิกส์ก่อนแล้วก็เรียนเคมีนะครับแล้วหลังจากนั้นเนี่ยถ้ามาในยุคของไบโอเทคโนโลยีก็คือชีวะท่านก็จะแนะนําว่าต้องเรียนฟิสิกส์เคมีแล้วก็ค่อยมาชีวะเพราะฉะนั้นศาสตร์ของวิทยาศาสตร์ทั้งหมดเนี่ยครับจะต้องมีให้ครบถ้วนนะครับเพื่อจะได้ตามการพัฒนาการต่างๆนะครับที่อยู่รอบตัวเราได้ครับ Well, in the same spirit, like astronomy, cosmology, because we have the instrument to see further and further away, those are areas developing very quickly, and with various lasers, we are understanding time-dependent phenomena very well, as well as Some structure or matter we are synthesizing many new things that were not in existence in the nature. So the field of science which will make progress will depend on these young people who can do something new. Then that field will develop very quickly. ครับท่านก็ได้เสริมขึ้นมาอีกนิดหนึ่งนะฮะก็คือว่าอย่างที่ได้พูดไปแล้วก็คือเราจะต้องมีองค์ประกอบที่ครบถ้วนนะครับในการที่เราจะค้นหาสิ่งใหม่ๆนะครับแต่แล้วก็ท่านก็ได้ชี้ว่าแล้วหนึ่งในองค์ประกอบนั้นก็คือพวกนักเรียนนะครับทุกคนที่จะต้องมีความคิดนะครับที่จะหาสิ่งใหม่ๆขึ้นมานะครับจากอุปกรณ์ที่มันมีวิวัฒนาการแล้วนะครับอาจารย์ก็ได้เปรียบเทียบกับถึงเกี่ยวกับเรื่องของดาราศาสตร์นะครับเครื่องมืออุปกรณ์ที่ใช้กันมานะฮะในเมื่อศตวรรษก่อนๆน,นะครับก็มีการดูดวงดาวอะไรไปได้ถึงไหนถึงไหนนะครับก็เช่นเดียวกันนะครับเมื่อมีองค์ประกอบที่พร้อมแล้วนะครับเรื่องของไบโอเทคโนโลยีพร้อมกับมีบุคลากรก็คือนักเรียนทุกๆคนเนี่ยนะครับที่จะมีความรู้ความสามารถและสามารถจะคิดออกไปนอกกรอบนะฮะคิดได้หาสิ่งใหม่ๆขึ้นมาได้เนี่ยการก้าวหน้านะครับของศาสตร์ด้านนี้ก็จะเกิดขึ้นครับโอเคแต่เป็นเรื่อง A lot of very interesting questions. Um, uh, let me ask you with this one first, since I think it's uh, a little bit related to what uh, you, the first question I've asked you before. Um, okay, so much. Okay, this one. ภาษาไทยนะครับคาถามโปรเฟสเซอร์ว่าคิดอย่างไรเกี่ยวกับการศึกษาที่เน้นทางด้านวิทยาศาสตร์นะครับก็จริงแต่มีการบังคับนะฮะโดยโดยอาจจะเป็นโรงเรียนนะครับไม่ให้อาจจะยังไงนะฮะให้เรียนเฉพาะในหัวจะหัวข้อดีคือเขาอยากจะเรียนในหัวข้อที่สนใจจริงจริงอย่างเช่นคอมพิวเตอร์กับฟิสิกส์นะครับแต่ว่าทางหลักสูตรเราต้องมีการบังคับให้ต้องเรียนชีวะเรียนอย่างอื่นด้วยนะครับถามว่าคิดยังไงท่านเฟสเซอร์คิดยังไงนะครับ here's a question from the students uh, they said um, um, how, what would be your comment or your idea about um, Education that students um, are are forced to learn in things that might not be their immediate interest. For example, uh, I have a question from a student that he's interested in computers and physics, but he has to learn in uh, biology as well in school. So he was wondering why he has to do that. Well, you have any comments on that? Thank you. Well. Um, It would be very interesting to say that uh, you might be interested in one thing, and how much you can learn and develop will eventually be limited by what else you know, what other areas you know. You see, in Taiwan, I often ask my music student, and she will say that I like to be a pianist. I want to play piano all the time, but School want us to learn the literature, write composition, and do all those things, and that will will make it difficult for her to play piano. So I said, "Listen, if you become a concert pianist and come in front of everybody and play a piece of piano, unless you are really very mature and you have lots of." Feeling, lots of sense of understanding. Feeling, you are very rounded person. You will only be a mechanical 
uh, instrument and play the music and you never become a great musician. So I would certainly recommend all those students in uh, want to learn piano. With all the uh, literature, uh, famous novels and love stories, so uh, lots of uh, interesting things one has to learn. The same thing here. In the computer sciences, you will know that the nature, nature is wonderful and when we often do things, try to emulate, the simu simulate or learn from the nature. So if you learn biology, one day you might find a biological computer. It's really much, much more advanced than the computer you're using and you might un want to understand why. And so at this stage, certainly broaden your scope and become a more rounded person is very important. ก็ตอบว่าอ่าองค์ความรู้นะครับว่าจริงๆเราจะมีความรู้หรือความสามารถแค่ไหนมันก็ถูกจํากัดด้วยเอ่อเรามีมีมีข้อมูลหรือปั
or how, how can we acquire new knowledge. And also, since the world is changing so fast, um, and can, uh, by building a new knowledge, can it cause a harm to the earth, to, to the people? I think it's the speed of uh, knowledge that we're discovering is, is so quickly, so fast. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, let me talk a little bit about acquire acquisition of new knowledge. When I went to Berkeley to become a graduate student, I worked with Professor, late Professor Mahan for my PhD degree. We sit down and discuss what would be my research subject. And he suggested that I might study ionization of electronic excited atoms because there are many things which, which was not known at that time. And it was interesting. I asked him many questions. The late Professor Mann said, if I were to know the answer, I've done it long time ago. So you have to do it. You have to find the answer. So for many, many months, many years, whenever he came, he always asked me, what's new? So I told him what I've done. And then the next question is, what are you going to do next? I did find Professor Mahan, late Professor Mahan, didn't know anything about the research subject he gave it to me. And I was disappointed at that time. So I came from Taiwan. My parents spent half the fortune to buy an airline ticket to send me to America and then work with a very famous professor. And he said, I don't know. And he was very honest because he know how much knowledge you acquire. But go beyond, go beyond the current knowledge, he doesn't really know. So that was the, the reason I was saying, we keep on studying, 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 but it might not help you to go beyond what we know. So acquiring new knowledge and learning acquired knowledge is a very different thing. So one has to be curious, one has to be able to think yourself and solve all the problems. So you might ask, does that mean that they, all the time you, you study in the school is wasted then? It's not quiet. In the process of learning, acquired knowledge, we did learn how to learn new things. So sometimes, not in the classroom, through many other discussions with students and grouping together and learn something. We learn to learn new things, and that is really quite important. And so in school, especially in high school, like, like your high school, teacher will give lectures. And you get the impression he knows everything. Then you go to the university, teacher sometimes tell you, I don't know what's going on on this. Then you go to the graduate school, then professor tell you, I don't know anything about this. So it's, it's kind of strange that you from acquire knowledge to acquiring the new knowledge, and then go to the graduate school, teacher say, I don't know. If I knew what's going on, I would have won the Nobel Prize. And that is the honest answer. So that, that was the reason why I did feel I was cheated in the graduate school. In high school, why my, pro, my teacher didn't tell me he didn't know many things. If he was more honest, then I, I could be more curious and try to, to learn in a different way by going through research. So uh, that was part of the reason I said one should allow students more time to do things, so learning to acquire new knowledge themselves. As to the knowledge you acquire and put into practice, for example, like Freon, eventually damage ozone layers we didn't know. And many things we are doing, we worry about the future consequences, especially something like GMO and other things. So scientists do have the responsibility. They really have to do their best to understand what is the consequences when this scientific knowledge 
were to apply to the society or for, this, for the production of certain things. And this is really important. And that was part of the reason I keep on talking about the social responsibility of scientists. We will not do something which is harmful. At the same time, we will not do, we have to take a group responsibility to see to it science will bring benefit to mankind. And once in a while, you will find unpredicted things happen and science might have some negative impact. But we really work very hard to make sure the positive impact will overwhelm the negative impact. And that's the responsibility of scientists. And that is one of the reasons Rothbard, in 1995, he did say, you should not do research just for the sake of interest alone. You, when, when you discover something, you have to think of the social consequences. And this is very important. ครับในส่วนของสองคำถามนะครับพระเวสเซอร์ก็ได้ตอบว่าคำถามที่หนึ่งก็คือการที่เราจะหาความรู้ใหม่ๆนะครับองค์ความรู้ใหม่ท่าน
uh, the way to solve this problem or to counter this problem. And um, he also mentioned that if we only have the power, the only s the, the sun, the energy from the sun or something like that. Yeah. Well, the, um, it is interesting. I started my lecture by saying long time ago, Earth is infinity. It means after millions and millions of years, on the surface of the Earth, we establish biosphere. Biosphere is very, very thin. And human being is part of the biosphere. So the activity of human society is, on, is part of the biosphere. We didn't seem to harm the biosphere for many thousands of years. But if you look at the last 250 years, especially after Industrial Revolution, what we are doing is digging material under the biosphere, like petroleum, coal, and at the same time, digging out the iron ore, iron oxide, aluminum bauxite, and using oil to reduce burning it, use coal to reduce iron ore. So under the biosphere, we dig it up and produce the energy to create many buildings and all those kind of things. And we call it ourselves, we have developed. So developing world is really the process of using material underground and then transform the material into steel, concrete, and other things to make our life easier and prosperous. So the first thing you are going to run out is the energy. Fossil fuel accumulated for so many years, it's going to run out. Not that fossil fuel, including coal, will run out in such a short time. Because of the global warming trend, we cannot keep on burning the low grade fuel minutes. It means sun is transmitting the energy to the surface of the earth in just 55 minutes. Sun transmit enough energy to function the human society for the entire year. So if we were to be smart enough, we can use solar energy more effectively than the energy crisis probably will be able to overcome. I'm only worried that it might take 40, 50 years to be able to solve the energy problem, but the problem will occur within the next 20 years. We are going to recycle concrete steel such that it will no longer necessary to dig up so much materials from underground, but use, reuse existing materials again and again. So when we said we run out resources, the main resource we are going to run out first is the energy. So we have to go to the solar energy. So scientists all said the future of energy is in solar energy. So how can you harvest solar energy? Solar energy, after it radiated to the surface of the Earth, it will become wind power, ocean flow, temperature gradient, also um, oh, tide, ocean tide, and all those contain lots of energies. But direct conversion of solar energy, if one learn to do it effectively, 10%, then it only takes 1% of the area of the earth, of the land, to provide enough electricity to run the human society for whole year. So this is really a major challenge. Many of you sitting in this room will be able to make contributions. Now, if you take a silicon chip, you can convert 30% of solar energy into electricity, but it's too expensive to make those chips. Nowadays, people try to use nanosciences, titanium oxide coated with dye cell, and you can get 10% efficiency. That's really quite good, and it's cheaper but there's a room to improve. So the resources could be solved if 
for next generation young scientists were to be able to discover something new or invent something new. เฟสเซอรี่ก็บอกว่าในตั้งแต่วรรณกรรมมานะฮะตั้งแต่อดีตมาเนี่ยนะครับคือชีวิตบนโลกมันก็เกิดอยู่เพียงแค่ตรงส่วนที่ผิวโลกเท่านั้นเองนะครับในส่วนที่เป็นไบโอสเฟียร์นะครับแล้วเมื่อก่อนนี้จริงๆแล้วกิจกรรมของมนุษย์เนี่ยก็ไม่ได้ทําให้เกิดผลกระทบอะไรมากนักนะครับแต่หลังจากยุคปฏิวัติอุตสาหกรรมเนี่ยนะครับมนุษย์ก็ได้ทําการขุดนะเอาเอาแร่ธาตุต่างๆมาใช้เอาน้ํามันมาใช้นะครับเอาทรัพยากรต่างๆในของโลกมาใช้อย่างมากนะครับก็ทําให้เกิดาการขาดแคลนซึ่งทรัพยากรเหล่านั้นนะครับท่านก็บอกว่าทรัพยากรตัวแรกเลยที่จะสําคัญที่สุดก็คือพลังงานนะครับเพราะปัจจุบันนี้เราใช้เป็นลักษณะของฟอสซิลฟูลหรือพลังงานจากซากฟอสซิลนะซึ่งเรียกกับปิโตรเลียมแก๊สธรรมชาติและพวกถ่านหินนะครับซึ่งปัจจุบันนี้เนี่ยเราก็ใช้พลังงานจากแก๊สธรรมชาติกับปิโตรเลียมค่อนข้างจะเยอะนะครับและยังไงก็ตามเนี่ยถึงแม้ว่าเราจะยังใช้ต่อไปได้อาจจะมีแหล่งพลังงานต่อไปอีกหลายปี4ี่สิบห้าสิบหกสิบปีก็ตามแต่ว่าท่านก็คิดว่าคงจะมีมันมีวิกฤตการอื่นๆที่เข้ามาซึ่งทำอาจจะทําให้เราต้องหยุดใช้ไปก่อนก็ได้เช่นวัติการโลกร้อนนะครับหรือว่าที่เราอุณหภูมิของโลกมันเปลี่ยนแปลงไปเนื่องจากการเผาไหม้จนมากเกินไปนะครับท่านก็เลยพูดต่อไปว่าอย่างนั้นพลังงานจริงๆแล้วท่านที่ควรจะหันไปไปหาเป็นแหล่งอีกแหล่งหนึ่งก็คือพลังงานจากแสงอาทิตย์นะครับซึ่งท่านก็บอกว่าพลังงานจากแสงอาทิตย์เนี่ยมันมากมายมหาศาลเหลือเกินก็คือพลังงานที่คนเราใช้ทั้งโลกเนี่ยนะครับ6 0 0 0กว่าล้านคนเนี่ยใช้ใน1ปีเนี่ยนะครับจริงๆแล้วเนี่ยเท่ากับปริมาณของแสงอาทิตย์พลังงานในแสงที่ฉายบนโลกที่ใช้เวลาเพียง55นาทีเท่านั้นเองคือถ้ารับพลังงานทั้งหมดใน5ใน1ชั่วโมงประโดยประมาณที่ที่ดวงที่ส่งมาให้โลกเนี่ยเราสามารถใช้ไปได้ทั้งปีนะครับแต่ปัญหาตรงนี้ก็คือว่าประสิทธิภาพในการที่จะกับเก็บพลังงานตัวนั้นเนี่ยเราหรือว่าที่จะเก็บเอาพลังงานนั้นมาใช้นะครับยังไม่ดีพอนะครับปัจจุบันเนี่ยโซลาเซลล์เนี่ยก็สามารถที่จะรับพลังงานอย่างมากสุดก็ประมาณ 10% นะฮะหรือมากกว่านั้นนิดๆหน่อยนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยท่านก็บอกว่าตรงนี้แหละคงจะต้องมีการพัฒนาใช้ต่อไปแล้วก็ได้ฝากความหวังไว้กับพวกเรานะครับท่านก็บอกว่าคนที่จะมาพัฒนาตรงนี้ต่อไปเนี่ยก็คงต้องเป็นพวกเรานะครับบางท่านที่อยู่ในห้องนี้นะครับนักเรียนบางคนในนี้แหละที่จะที่จะต้องออกไปแล้วก็ไปพัฒนาต่อไปซิว่าเราสามารถที่จะเก็บเอาพลังงานจากดวงอาทิตย์นั้นมาใช้ได้มากขึ้นหรือไม่อย่างไรนะครับขอบคุณครับ And also I also want to add for the next 20 years one thing one can accomplish and sure to be able to do it is to save energy for example if you look at the lighting here in this room we are using fluorescent lamp which is much more efficient than incandescent lamp but the light emitting diode It's now available. It's a little more expensive. It's much more efficient than this. So, lighting could save the energy by a factor two. Air conditioning also can save the energy by a factor two. And automobile, by using hybrid engine, uh, using constant burning internal combustion engine with electric charging discharge system, could gain another factor two. So actually. The current technology will allow us to save energy and make us live as comfortably as we are now, and this something will happen during the next 20 years. ท่านได้เสริมนิดนึงนะครับว่าก่อนที่จะจริงๆก่อนที่จะไปคิดถึงว่าเราจะพัฒนาอะไรไปได้ในอนาคตเนี่ยนะครับสิ่งที่เราทําได้ในปัจจุบันก่อนก็คือการประหยัดนะครับนะถ้าพูดถึงว่าหลอดไฟหลอดไฟต่างๆการให้แสงสว่างนะครับหรือแอร์คอนดิชันปัจจุบันนี้เราก็มีเทคโนโลยีที่สูงขึ้นอย่างเช่นที่เป็นหลอดไฟธรรมดาหรือหลอดฟลูออเรสเซนต์เหล่านี้ซึ่งประหยัดไฟได้เยอะแล้วนะครับเราก็อาจจะมีพวกไดโอดเปล่งแสงซึ่งสามารถที่จะประหยัดไฟหรือการเปลี่ยนพลังงานจากไฟฟ้าเป็นแสงเนี่ยยิ่งประสิทธิภาพยิ่งดีขึ้นไปอีกนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นตรงนี้ก็คือว่าก็คือบอกว่ายังไงตอนนี้เราสิ่งที่เราทําได้คือช่วยกันประหยัดนะครับไม่ว่าจะเป็นไฟฟ้านะครับการการการขับรถยนต์นะครับแล้วก็แอร์คอนดิชันเหล่านี้ที่เราทําได้เราควรจะทําไปก่อนเลยครับครับผมไม่ทราบว่าเราเหลือเวลาอีกสักใช่ครับ the last five minutes okay so this will be a last series of questions then มีคําถามหลายๆคําถามนะครับที่จริงๆแล้วก็ซ้ําๆกันนะครับเกี่ยวกับว่าอยากจะทราบแนวทางงานวิจัยต่อไปในอนาคตนี่นะครับว่าจะเป็นในแนวไหนนะครับแล้วก็อีกอันหนึ่งก็คือว่า
ทาง professor เนี่ยสามารถที่จะแก้ปัญหาอุปสรรคต่างๆในการทำวิจัยเนี่ยได้อย่างไรนะครับและสุดท้ายนะครับก็จะไปต่อถึงว่าหลายๆท่านอยากทราบว่าความหวังในการได้รับรางวัลโนเบลของไทยเนี่ยอยู่ไกลเกินไปหรือเปล่านะครับแล้วก็แล้วก็จะทำอย่างไรจะทำให้ประชาชนเนี่ยเห็นเห็นความสำคัญของวิทยาศาสตร์มากยิ่งขึ้นนะครับผมว่ามันก็เป็นคำถามที่ต่อเนื่องกัน I think I have a series of questions this is our final series of questions we're going to have five minutes um, the first question is that what would be the next theme or the next research topics that would have a uh, significant impact to our way of living and the second question is What inspire you um, to do your research, and how can you overcome the obstacle of doing research? What is a technique that you use to overcome those um, problems? And finally, um, a lot of people would like to know how far away are we um, as Thai people or Asian people to uh, win another Nobel Prize? And also, the last question would be. Um, What can we do to alert people uh, of our people, the Thai people, to have more understanding of science and see its importance uh, in the future, or to have more importance? Okay. Well, the first question: What is the area which will you know, will happen such that it will be a major breakthrough? I would say this the area. Some of you might discover something. l a n a s p o r i n used to say that the science only make progress when young student told his teacher that you are wrong. You are wrong. What you told told me are all wrong. And if student turn out to be right, then the science will make progress. If teacher is always right. Student always learn from the teachers. Then it's nothing new, right? Teacher keep on giving his classes. A student always n o t h i s head and say, "Yes, I understand. I know. I get 100 point in the exam." There's nothing new. It is only when student find something wrong about what you said. I did some research and I find out it's not true. It's not this way. And if student turn out to be right, then. At that moment, science will make progress. So very often, people ask me, "What area of science will have a breakthrough?" I will have to tell them that the, whatever area you make a big, big breakthrough, that will be the area science will make big breakthrough. Again, the discovery sometimes depend on luck. Somebody is very fortunate. Discover something great, but you do have to understand. Lady of Fortune always took care of those who are well prepared. So, for scientific research in Thailand, it is important that you have the fertile land. So, you will have lots of discussion. Lots of people have an inquiry in mind. Keep on asking good questions, then you will discover something. Scientific discovery cannot be planned. Technological development can be planned, but scientific discovery cannot be planned. Fifty years ago, a group of scientists got together. They made the prediction: what will happen in science 50 years from now? Nobody made the right right prediction. Nobody. Everybody tried to predict something just by extending the current knowledge. But semiconductor, they didn't even know, and how that will transform the current society through computer information technology. Nobody predicted at that time. Well, as to how do I overcome my obstacle? It is interesting. Many scientists are not as confident. If somebody is very confident, they probably will not become a good scientist. 
because scientists have to keep on asking questions, keep on asking, are you sure this is right? Is that the right answer? You have to dig very deep. So scientists often suffer from the lack of enough confidence. So at Berkeley, sometimes we have new students coming in. The teacher always wants to pick students who are not very confident. Overconfident people, they always say they become a politician, but probably not a good scientist. And because of lack of confidence, we do have some problems. Even you got the right answer, you might not be able to convince yourself immediately, so you keep on verifying, verifying. And I did find, not only myself, among many of my former students in California, Chicago, or in Taiwan, many people, when they have some obstacles, there are two groups of people. One group of people will come back home and sit down and think, why I have problem. Then after analyzing it, they say, okay, maybe problem is reason one, two, or three. And then he will come to the conclusion, tomorrow I will try according to number one wrote, or number two, then that person can sleep well because he know what he's going to do next or tomorrow. So early in the morning, when we got together in the laboratory, some of the students would get excited and say, Professor Lee, I think we should do this way. I think we're wrong. We pursue the wrong way. We should move this direction. And those are the type of person who can keep on bumping into the obstacle, always find a new way of doing things. But I do have a group of, another, another group of students. When they bump into the obstacle, they will go home and sleep, sleep very well. But second morning, he will come and say, Professor Lee, what should I do? And I know he would be hopeless. Those students who thought very deep could not sleep until he find the directions. So the only thing I can uh, make a recommendation is, when you have an obstacle, you analyze it. Analyze what's the reason, what is the possible way to solve those. And then try again after you have enough rest, enough sleep. So as you are persistent, keep on asking good questions. Then you will get there. So overcoming the obstacle is easy. Always analyzing the next step, analyzing the next step and persist and keep on doing, then you'll be okay. Thai people, when are you going to have some Nobel laureate? I don't think it is really important to, to have somebody win a Nobel Prize some places, but certainly it's reflect the scientific activity of one country. So I, I'll tell you one story which was very interesting. I was in Korea and one of the president, former president of Pohan University, who passed away. And people are discussing. Professor Kim, he was the president of the Pohan University. He's a very good man. So he will end up in the heaven. He will not go to the hell. And so the question is, if he go to the heaven, what is he going to ask the God? And people came to the conclusion and said, he certainly will ask God why you are so unfair. You send so many good scientists to United States, to Europe, but Korea, there's no single Nobel laureate. And God would say, and that was uh, during the conversation, God said, I'm very fair. I distributed smart people all over the world. Like in Thailand, you have lots of smart people sitting in this room. So God said they distributed very evenly. So Professor Kim said, then what happened to uh, Einstein? And the God said, your Einstein, he failed the entrance examination. Because he looked at the first problem, he's thinking very deeply. So he was asking the question, answer the question and said, if 
something like that were to be true, then it might be this way, and he thinking so deep before he answered the first question, the bell rang, and examination sheet was collected, so Einstein failed the entrance examination. And that was a joke in Korea, but it is certainly true in Taiwan. Entrance examination probably would not pick the smart one. Many of the so-called who are very slow learner, creative learner, will end up in America because could not follow the pace of the learning pace in Taiwan. We end up with end up in America, and they might do well. So I think in Thailand, for Thailand to have somebody win Nobel Prize, certainly your research environment has to keep on improving. More fun has to be invested in scientific research. Then it was sometime naturally somebody will make important contribution and be recognized. As to understand the importance of science, it is rather unfortunate. Many politicians will look at the problem from economic or high-tech competition in the economic development. So they do understand high-tech is important for push economy, but they probably do not understand how important it is to have a society maintain good scientists doing good basic research. Even if you want to develop high technology, unless you have good scientists, absorb some knowledge, create some knowledge, one might not be able to do it. So in order for politicians to be sensitized, you have to keep on telling politicians it is important to support science. A couple of weeks ago, I did meet with your Prime Minister Taksin. He was saying that uh, we learned to grow oil on land, and he talked to Malaysian Prime Minister. You're lucky. You're underground, you have oil. You can also grow oil. And so I told him, I told uh, Prime Minister Taksin, photosynthesis efficiency is less than 1%. Photovoltaic cell can convert more than 10%. If you have infinite amount of land, you don't have enough manpower, then you can certainly plant eucalyptus or plant many things to harvest biomass. In terms of efficiency, it's different. But I don't think he understood what I was saying. But he was quite, quite excited about on the land, one can harvest the energy. So it is the responsibility of scientists to persuade the government official, politicians. It is important to develop science, promote science in any country. And we are quite successful in Taiwan. So during the last 10 years, science budget went up at the rate of 10% a year, continuously, for 10 years. And I don't know how to do it here, but I'm sure somebody else here must be trying very hard to convince the government official politicians science is important. And in order to, to persuade them that the science is important, they should understand science. So, popularization of science certainly is important. That should be the major responsibility of every scientist also. Well, well thank you very much. I think time is up and... Okay, thank you very much, Professor Yuan. Um, just sarup, uh, nakap. Sansan loy, koku wa kam top, samlap kwati nung, nakap koku wa titang hong ami jai nye. นะครับจะเกิดขึ้นได้ยังไงก็คือว่านักเรียนทุกคนจะต้องถามคําถามเยอะๆนะครับแล้วก็ต้องมีโชคนิดหนึ่งนะฮะที่จะได้หัวข้อวิจัยที่ถูกต้องแล้วก็หัวข้อวิจัยที่น่าสนใจและจะเป็นประโยชน์ต่อสังคมของเรานะครับ
คือสุดท้ายแล้วโปรเฟสเซอร์บอกว่าคำตอบนี้คือท่านไม่มีคำตอบแล้วก็ไม่แนะนำด้วยว่ามันเป็นเป็นแนวทางอะไรนะครับต้องไปค้นหากันเองนะครับแล้วก็เรื่องของอแนวทางการทำวิจัยนะครับก็ให้ทุกคนมีความมั่นใจนะครับก็คือต้องมี confidence นะฮะแล้วก็พยายามแก้ปัญหาแล้วก็วิเคราะห์ปัญหาแล้วก็ขยันแล้วก็ดื้อนะครับเกาะติดกับงานวิจัยที่เราจะทำนะครับเราก็จะแก้ปัญหาตรงนั้นได้ในส่วนของเรื่องของโนเบลนะครับก็อยากจะใหเ้เมืองไทยเนี่ยนะครับพัฒนางานวิจัยให้มากขึ้นนะครับแล้วก็สักวันหนึ่งก็อาจจะมีอย่างพวกเราเนี่ยนะครับสามารถจะผลิตงานที่ทางชาติชาติอื่นๆนะครับนานาชาติเขายอมรับนะครับก็จะได้รางวัลโนเบลแต่ท่านก็ได้พูดตัวอย่างหลายๆตัวอย่างนะครับแต่ว่าหลักๆแล้วก็คือเราต้องช่วยกันพัฒนาความเป็นวิทยาศาสตร์ของประเทศชาติของเรานะครับแล้วในสุดท้ายเนี่ยเราก็จะได้รางวัลที่เรารอคอยนะครับสุดท้ายนะครับเราจะทํายังไงให้ประชาชนเห็นความสําคัญเกี่ยวกับวิทยาศาสตร์นะครับเราก็ต้องช่วยกันผลักดันแล้วก็ให้ทางรัฐบาลนะครับหน่วยงานต่างๆเนี่ยเห็นความสําคัญตรงนี้แล้วก็สนับสนุนแล้วก็ท่านก็ได้ยกตัวอย่างอันนึงเกี่ยวกับเรื่องของไบโอแมสซึ่งหลายๆคนก็ถามมาในคำถามนี้ก็คือว่าจริงๆแล้วประเทศไทยเนี่ยสามารถจะทําน้ํามันได้บนดินนะครับก็คือการปลูกพืชแต่จริงๆท่านก็ได้เสนอว่าการปลูกพืชนั้นเนี่ยโฟโตซินเทสิสเนี่ยมันมี efficiency นะครับแค่ 1% เท่านั้นนะครับในขณะเดียวกันถ้าเกิดเราใช้แสงอาทิตย์ก็คือโซลาเซลล์เนี่ย efficiency นี่มันมากกว่านั้นเยอะนะครับเพราะนั้นมันอาจจะไม่มีประโยชน์ที่เราจะมาปลูกตรงนี้คือเราต้องคิดอะไรให้ลึกซึ้งนะครับโดยการที่เรารู้วิทยาศาสตร์เนี่ยเราสามารถจะคิดอย่างลึกซึ้งได้นะครับก็สุดท้ายท่านก็หวังว่านักเรียนที่มาฟังในวันนี้นะครับจะกลับไปเป็นคนที่ช่างคิดช่างถามแล้วก็คิดอะไรเป็นวิทยาศาสตร์นะครับแล้วก็คิดลึกเกาะติดงานวิจัยนะครับตรงนี้ก็จะพาประเทศไทยไปสู่ความเป็นประเทศที่มีความรู้ทางวิทยาศาสตร์ที่ก้าวหน้าแล้วก็หวังว่าสักวันหนึ่งหนึ่งในพวกท่านในนี้นะครับก็อาจจะมีส่วนที่เข้าไปใกล้กับรางวัลโนเบลไพรส์มากขึ้นนะครับก็ขอขอบคุณครับผมดรรัชชาติมงคลนาวินและดรรัตพิชยางกูลจากจุฬาลงกรณ์มหาวิทยาลัยนะครับมาช่วยแปลในวันนี้ถ้าหากผิดพลาดอย่างใดก็ขออภัยไว้ณที่นี้ด้วยนะครับ and finally um, thank you very much professor for all the answers to the questions now I will hand over to the uh, MC to conclude yes. the uh, proceeding thank you Thank you for every questions and answers. Professor Lee, my name is Thip Rampai t h a m a m u n g k u t On behalf of the students and staff at Mahidon, I'd like to thank you for such a thoughtful and interesting and inspiring lecture today, which is clearly shows us about the responsibilities of scientists to share the scientific knowledge and technologies to a globalized world. For making the peaceful world, many of us here today, including myself, are science students. Before long, we'll be entering to the world of science and technology. But I think that after today, we can, thanks to Professor Lee, to take with us a new hope, a new visions of what we can do. In helping to build a cleaner, a more prosperous world, and more peaceful world for everyone, maybe rich or poor. Ladies and gentlemen, please will you join with me in thanking our honoured guest today, Professor Yuan T. Lee. And also, I would like to take this chance to thank you to Dr. Rat and Dr. Natasha for being our interpreter today. And I also would like to thank you to International Peace Foundations who are organized to the bridges dialogue towards a culture of peace. And I also like to express our sincere gratitude to the Science Society of Thailand under the patronage of His Majesty the King of Thailand. And the National Science and Technology Development Agency. On behalf of students here, please accept our sincere thank you very much again.
And finally, I'd like to invite Dr. Tongshai Shu Prisha to give a token of our appreciation to Professor Yuan T. Lee. And also, Brisha Dalek tours the culture of peace to Mr. Uwe Mosawet's International Peace Foundation. Thank you very much, Dr. Tongshai Shu Brisha, and everyone for coming here today. Have a good afternoon.